Jeannie Hives, great to see you again. It's been a long time. I, I looked up and I think it's been about March since we've last talked. And my goodness, that seems like about two years ago, given all that has gone on in the world. And you know, the, the pace yeah. of change, we've gone through the COVID thing, we're still in that. We've gone through the whole rioting, the uh, George Floyd situation. We're gonna be talking about a number of those issues. But as we are taping this now in the afternoon of July the 17th, one of the biggest stories of the year breaks out with the uh, Northern District of Illinois, a, a federal investigation charging uh, ComEd with bribery and fining them $200 million and then naming uh, House Speaker mm -hmm. Michael Madigan as quote, public official A in, in those uh, charges. Uh, let me start off before we get into it with comments made by Governor Pritzker from this morning. Let's take a listen to that first. With okay. what is being reported, the speaker has a lot that he needs to answer for. To authorities, to investigators, and most importantly, to the people of Illinois. These allegations strike at the core of what public service means. It's a high calling public service. It's a high calling one in which we serve with a sacred trust to put the people first. If these allegations of wrongdoing by the speaker are true, there is no question that he will have betrayed the public trust and he must resign, therefore. In the and he must resign, therefore, says uh, the governor, if he has been proven to break the public trust. Before we start, let me just insert, if I might, to be fair to the speaker. The speaker spokesman came out and said, uh, he, referring to the speaker, has never made a legislative decision with improper motives and has engaged in no wrongdoing here, and he claimed to the contrary is unfounded. And that from Madigan spokesman Maura Pusley. Uh, Jeannie Ives, you had served, you're running for Congress, but you had served for six years in the House of Representatives as a Republican, so you're certainly familiar with the climate down there and with the speaker and his control of the Democratic caucus. What is your reaction to this breaking news that we had today? Well, it's about time. And there's no, I mean, there's no question that Mike Madigan is going to try and weasel out of this. Uh, and, you know, and I don't see that happening this time. I think the evidence is pretty solid. Otherwise, you would not have the federal authorities come in with such a strong statement. And you would not have ComEd agreeing to spend $200 million in, for bribery charges. So he's got uh, better. He's I'm sure he's lawyering up as we speak, and I think he's in big trouble, and he should be. Listen, there's been one corruption scandal after another under him, and if Mike Madigan uh, were uh, the you know if he, somebody else was in charge of him, they would fire Mike Madigan just like Mike Madigan fired other folks like Kevin Quinn, like um, Tim Mapes, other people that were under him for various sexual harassment allegations. This is a very serious charge, and uh, Governor Pritzker, uh, well, good for him for asking for Madigan to resign, but it really rings hollow when the same day the Sun-Times came out with another report saying that Berrios is under investigation. We know the governor's still under federal investigation for property tax fraud. So I hope that he feels the same way when the feds indict him, that he should resign as well. And uh, as we, as we, uh or having this news break, I haven't heard from other House uh, Democrats. Do you have any feel how much loyalty there would be behind to the speaker? I'm, I'm somewhat surprised over the years as who is uh, loyal to the speaker and, and some of those who are not. Well, they, it's silence, right? Crickets, so far, yeah. no <laughs> any of them, no comment no. from, um, uh, Sean Caston, who I'm running against, who is cozy with the speaker. No comment from Jack Franks, who did the speaker's bed bidding, and he's in a tight race in McHenry County. Uh, no comment from any of these state reps that got elected in this 2018 blue wave. No comment, and they took millions of dollars of Madigan's money to get elected. And the reason they're quiet is because Madigan's keep, uh, keeping their quiet. But make no mistake here, this is a huge problem for everybody who's on Madigan's uh, uh, payroll, everybody who has helped Madigan, the unions are in trouble at this point. Uh, the fact that IBEW gave Madigan in the fourth quarter of last year 
over a million dollars and he used it to pay legal fees and then again another half a million dollars nearly came out uh in in union uh um payoffs to madigan and his campaign account for legal fees again look madigan knows he's in trouble he's shaking down all the people that he has given crony deals to that have, has really betrayed the trust of the taxpayers for for decades and it's all going to get undone right now and i'm thrilled it's independence day in the state of illinois you know i want to talk to you about your uh, race for congress but let me just before we leave this topic uh, which we could do a whole show, and I'm not going to do that, but we could do a whole show on the Madigan thing. Uh, but for those uh, who are watching this and they're not as familiar with the climate of the state capitol and what goes on in Illinois politics, put this into perspective. How big of a story is this? And, and tell, tell those viewers who, who don't follow, why is, why is this potentially a massive story, this, the Madigan story? Well, because it will be Madigan's undoing. I mean, I think, I th again, the evidence is, has got to be solid. And the fact that they're raiding his offices right now down in Springfield, it, at least that's what people are uh, reporting uh, from the street, is means that they really do have the goods on him. ComEd, again, would not make this type of settlement if they had clean hands. And I know for a fact, when I sat down there and watched the whole Exxon bailout bill go through in 2016, I, you could just feel that there was a dirty deal getting done. This made no sense to bail out a company that had a $2.2 billion profit statement the year before and give them a $2.4 billion bailout. Obviously, there was other things going on here and Madigan extracted whatever he could out of them. Uh, I, I mean, there's just no doubt that's everybody. <laughs> everybody knows when you're a freshman, you know immediately your bill's not going to get passed if Madigan doesn't approve it. It's just, in fact, the first bill that I ran, it was in Jack Frank's, Jack Frank's committee, the first bill. And I went to Jack and I said, hey, I want to run this bill in your committee. And he said to me, I was told to kill your bill, but because I like you, I'll let you run it. Now that came straight from Mike Madigan. Mike Madigan, many would say, was the, uh, the cork in the bottle, as I say, the bottleneck to change uh, that he just wasn't going to allow any number of things to change. So that's that's also why I would say this is a big issue. But that said, uh, go ahead. Go I ahead. know I know you want to go on. I have a couple things more well, that I, I, I just want to be fair to you great. as far as your campaign. But let's go. I that's want great. No, I mean this is this is entirely my campaign. It is an anti-corruption campaign from the get-go. It is an anti-self-dealing campaign from the get-go. And we can talk about Sean Caston and his self-dealing that he's already engaged in. In, in Congress, I'm happy to talk about that. But look, uh, th let's go back to uh, Frank Martino. Frank Martino, Mike Madigan's right-hand man, under, uh, again, federal investigation for misuse of his campaign finances. What happens, though? We find out word when things start to get hot that he's cooperating with the federal investigators. And this is from like the spring of 2016. Does anybody wonder if he's the one squealing on Madigan and his operation? How about Ed Burke? Is he squealing on Madigan? I'll tell you what, there's people talking and it's going to get good uh, for, for taxpayers. We're going to get reform. Uh, we have to have reform. This is an outrageous tenure of corruption in this state. Payoffs, corruption, I, I'm, I'm fed up with it. I stood against all of it in Springfield. I watched as these people got away with really bad policy ideas, really bad legislation. And you always wondered why. It's because somebody was getting paid off on the back end and, and the, the public sectors were getting whatever they wanted at the same time. And the Democrats have been silent, silent the whole time. It's disgusting. A couple of years ago, you were in the House when the we said the ComEd bill went through, were you not? back then? I was there for the, the, the re-up of their 2011 legislation, which is, it was, was cited in some of the reports today, but I was, uh, and they had a, uh, an extension of that. I voted, um, I did not vote for that at all. And then uh, for the 2016 Exxon bailout bill, which I'm sure is also uh, part of this whole corrupt thing, I, I, abs I was adamantly opposed to that wrote you know, 2,000 words of an opposition to that. You can read it on my Facebook page. I reposted that, that op-ed that I did. And um, 
look, it just it was a, a bad deal. And all I'm trying around. to remember the Exxon bail. It wasn't. Was that the, this where we had the two nuclear plants, or am I remembering wrong? Yes, they were trying to save two nuclear plants, and it, you know it was just a huge bailout for a company. Like I'm not opposed to nuclear power at all, and uh, honestly, the the, the Exxon, uh, many of the the their workers. A lot of them, the corporate people, it's like just a, a street over from the edge of my district. They work in this district. I mean, they live in this district. That's fine. That's great. I'm sure they're great people, but their company is corrupt, and they didn't they didn't stand up to Madigan. They played footsie with him, and it, it, it it's just it, it's awful. And uh, and by the way, uh, you know, the Sun Times got the article wrong, saying that ComEd's going to pay two hundred million dollars in a penalty in a, a fine. Uh, that's not true. ComEd's not going to pay it. ComEd's ratepayers are going to pay it. And those are, that's me. That's my family. That's the family down the street. That's the businessman who's been put out of work by the government for the last four months. And they're going to be the ones paying for this malfeasance. I think people need to be personally held liable for the, the acts that have happened. And, you know, it, you, we should even consider uh, uh, absolutely breaking up ComEd and taking it out to bid for another company that can run things ethically. Why is this happening now? Is this because President Trump is in office? Well, look, I, I think that that's, that uh, whoever's in charge of running these departments has a lot of influence as to what gets investigated and to what degree that they get investigated. There's there's no doubt about it. And that's why for you know the last decade or so that you've had a Democrat attorney general, that's why you've seen no public corruption. Lisa Madigan could not find any public corruption in her entire span of her tenure as the attorney general. And Kwame Rahul, same thing. They have said nothing. And there is no doubt in my mind, and I said this two years ago, this is not just a, an extemporaneous comment for today. I said this two years ago. There is no doubt in my mind that Lisa Madigan knows that it's all coming up. The corruption is going to be exposed. And that's why she did not run again in 2018. There's, I said that two years ago, that that's probably the reason that she's running, because you could see the corruption before your eyes. I'm very close to the Edgar County watchdogs. They expose corruption all the time, whether it's been at College DuPage or, or elsewhere. And the, Lisa Madigan cannot find public corruption. She won't, she would not prosecute it. And there's no doubt in my mind that she knew Martino was squealing to the feds and that everything was going to come undone. That's my, that, that is exactly what I believe has happened here and that it took federal prosecutors because you cannot find an honest Democrat in the judicial system in a prosecutorial position that has any uh, influence in the Chicago or state level. There's probably some good ones in the environs, but I'm telling you right now from Kim Fox to Kwame to Lisa Madigan's tenure, they have done nothing to arrest public corruption. If you if you want, we can go on to some of these issues. We we've, we've talked about how much has changed in the world in the last four months, and one of the things that we uh, have seen is this whole uh, the George Floyd uh, case explode onto the scene, which led to violence, uh, which has led to these uh, crazy events where we have portions of American cities being blocked off, as we've seen in cities like yes. Minneapolis and then Seattle. Uh, we've had rioting in Chicago. We've had stores looted on Michigan Avenue on the Magnificent Mile. And, and we've had uh, uh, a failure of prosecutors, which you just brought up, a failure of prosecutors to take on some of these, the looters and the criminals. And now, mm -hmm. uh, recently in St. Louis, uh, we have a a couple who, when when you had uh, a number of so-called protesters, but they were protesters who broke into private property, uh, threatened a couple, at least by their presence, of being where they're not supposed to have been, and the couple defended their home with uh, guns. Now, the prosecuting attorney of St. Louis is going after the people who defended their homes with guns, but they're protected, one would think, by the Second Amendment. It is as if the whole standard of lawlessness or, or, or the judicial system has been stood on its head lately. Uh, give me some of your thoughts, if you would. Well, first of all, the, the murder of George Floyd is horrific. 
everybody watched that video and knows that it was malfeasance, knows that it was intentional, knows that these people will be held accountable. And thankfully, they are in they are jailed and they will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. I have no doubt now that the Democrats who are running Minneapolis and running that judicial system will fully prosecute. But let's be clear here. It's the Democrats and their Democrat run city of Minneapolis that allowed people like that police officer to remain on the police force. And, um, you know, he apparently had a plenty of other complaints against him that should have been suspect. We've all learned something in George Floyd's murder and we all are just, you know, grief stricken over it. I mean, despite his past, despite some of the allegations against him, and we have a lot more to find out about exactly what happened there, I have no doubt. Uh, but despite all that, nobody should be treated that way. Nobody should be left to die at the hands of a police officer during an arrest like that, like that, in that way. He was obviously defenseless. So uh, that's horrific. But what you've seen in terms of lawlessness, again, I, I cannot, you know, it, I'm not making it up. It's just fact. It is happening in Democrat strongholds. Seattle, literally, you have an autonomous zone set up where you let the lawless take over public streets and private businesses and intimidate people, citizens. How does that happen? And then until the mayor is, is, um, is actually threatened herself on her own property, does she then turn around and do something like this? These elitists sitting in political positions of power who refuse to enforce the law are the worst of the worst. I hope voters wake up and vote them off. But the lawlessness that you've seen in Illinois is typically found in city of Chicago and Cook County. That is where, and it is spilling over into the counties, the other counties, the surrounding counties, but at least our state's attorneys are prosecuting them when they come over the, our borders. The other thing that we have seen over the last several months is this cancel culture. And recently we had an example where the uh, CEO of uh, Goya Foods was at the White House for an event where the president signed an executive order to uh, uh, help the prosperity of the Hispanic community. And because the Goya CEO was there with the president, all of a sudden people were calling for a, a boycott of the, those foods. It turned out that people uh, who support the president went out of their way to make sure that didn't work and launched what they call a boycott and were buying Goya foods. But it's, it's just one more example that we seem to have in our society of so many people who just can't stand to hear someone who disagrees with them. And instead of just saying we are an America where we have freedom of speech and we share our ideas, it is increasingly becoming just a hostile environment where all of a sudden nobody gets to have their say. What Have you run into this? And, and you, if, if so, do you have any answers for it? Sure, you know, uh, the left wants to shout you down and they think if they speak loud enough and they yell loud enough and they call you a racist, uh, you know, which has no meaning at this point now, that they're going to get their way and you're gonna, they're not, you're, you're gonna just not, not make any arguments against them. I mean, this is awful. It's terrible what's happening on, uh, to professors on college campuses who don't feel like they can say anything. They're being threatened uh, with, uh, with firing. Some of them are losing their jobs. You've seen, oh gosh, who, who was it? The guy who in 1986, I think he's with one of the defense um, uh, contractors, basically said that he didn't believe that women should be in the combat arms. And they brought the, that 30 year old essay up and, they, and he had to resign. I mean, are you kidding me? That was the prevailing thought back in 1986. How ridiculous. It, 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 this, is t this is a terrible situation for our kids who are hyper scrutinized where there's a, a, you know, uh, super sensitive people around them all the time and when there's woke uh, educators who are bullying them, honestly, from, from staying silent in the classroom. I feel bad for our kids these days. And so adults have got to speak up against this and a shame on the left for trying to go after the, the CEO of Goya Foods. Shame on them. This is a guy who provides lots of good jobs. This is a guy who is a minority business owner. These are people that they usually celebrate and you know try and get them on their side and they're going after him. Boy, I hope his, I hope his employees vote solid red and I hope they vote for Trump after this. I mean, it's just awful, awful, awful. And by the way, I was one of those people. 
I went out and immediately bought some Goya products. I've never bought their product before. I went to the grocery store and bought it. And we have a food drive tomorrow morning. I hope it's full of Goya products as well. I, th th these, th you know, the, the American people have to stand up to this cancel culture. It's awful. And it's happening even at West Point. I am just appalled. You say it's happening at West Point and... Uh, oh yeah, there's a, there was a story out this week where nine graduates wrote a 40-page manifesto to the West Point administration, essentially saying that West Point has got systemic racism problems. Now, I have written a, uh, you know, a 1,600-word op-ed on this. It'll be up soon. But, uh, you know, th these are people, seven of the nine had really some of the best scholarships you can ever get in the world. So Rhodes Scholars, Marshall Scholars, Fulbright Scholars. They were very privileged cadets. They were among, even among cadets who are, it's a very, it's a privilege and an honor to go to West Point. It truly is. Uh, I always felt that way when I went there. I'm going to feel that same sort of way when I drop my son Joe off next week because he'll start as a new cadet there. It is a privilege to attend there and to wear the uniform of your country. Um, and the cadets that wrote this missive, seven of the nine had these massive scholarships and they were among the most privileged. They had very high ranking positions as cadets. They were treated, I, trust me, they were treated specially just to earn those scholarships. The reason I know that is because my other son who graduated in 2016 from, from the West Point was on that same track to get these, these scholarships and they are groomed. They are groomed for these scholarships. So these were among the most privileged cadets in a privileged institution. And they said that there's systemic racism. West Point is one of the most egalitarian systems out there. Look, if you cannot find all your points on the land navigation course in the allotted time, you're gonna fail. It doesn't matter if you're Hispanic or black or male or female, it doesn't matter. If you can't pass the indoor obstacle course test in the amount of time, you're gonna fail. And so I w I'm just appalled and because one of the demands of these woke West Point graduates was that they wanted uh, three of the superior officers there, the brigade tactical officer, who's white, the commandant, who's white, and the dean, who is a white woman. They wanted them to write personal apology letters for their white privilege and of course they left off the superintendent who is the top dog at West Point because he's black. I mean, you cannot make this up. It's appalling. Uh, American Conservative wrote a really good response to this letter once it was posted. I wrote my own response. That again, we will be publishing here shortly. I, uh, but this cancel culture, this idea that people need to apologize for their race, it, it, it's, it's, it's out of hand. When, uh, yeah, that's surprising. I should say to the audience that you are yourself a graduate of West Point. Uh, yeah. When you mention all that. I forget to say that, but I am a graduate. And so is my husband. Yeah, your husband. So did, is my sister-in-law. Was Now, of course, that was a number of years ago, but um, is there any reason that you have to think? Did you experience a, a culture of uh, uh, racism when you were at West Point? Obviously, you're a white person, uh, to, to point out the obvious. But I presume you served with um, uh, black uh, black cadets as well when you were there. Sure. Did you ever? And and I also presume that is there not a camaraderie between the cadets? Um, and wouldn't you have shared, or would they have shared with you if they were experiencing racism? Look, you have to get through it as a team. Everybody pulls together. I personally did not did not see it. Uh, but I was in the eighth class to graduate women, and so were there sexist comments made? Yes. Were half the time they ingest just to be goofy? Yes. It, are, you, are, you, are you hypersensitive about it? No. It, it, did they come from professors at times? Yeah, absolutely it happened. But I always understood it was an individual making the comment, and it was not a problem with the system. I did not believe that it was systemically race, uh, racist or sexist back then. I believe it was one of the most egalitarian places that you could serve. Now, um, this in this missive, too, that they wrote, um, these, these guys even went so for so far as to say that this is just the, the first part of what they're going to demand. They're also concerned about uh, uh, discrimination based on classism. 
or fat phobia. And I'm like, are they asking now that the military not have height weight standards? As far as classism goes, I'd like to remind these kids that if you want classism at Yale and Harvard and Princeton, it does not exist. You wear the same uniform, you eat the same food, you have the same standards. When you go to your math class, it's the same math instructor in front of all of you. I mean, this is the most egalitarian system. So for them to write this is just, it's, it's infuriating, quite frankly. And, very, and uh, that's why I wrote about it, because somebody needs to push back against this, this, this culture of finding uh, systemic racism when there is actually none, and when they have lived a very privileged existence at the academy and afterwards. Many of these cadets, or these new graduates, they're 18 and 19 graduates. Some of them have not even been to their first duty assignment because they are serving out uh, their initial time under scholarship conditions. So they're at Oxford, for example, with a Rhodes Scholarship. They've not even met their first troop. I, I'm here to tell you that they do not care that you are the captain of the crew team at West Point. They care whether or not you can uh, carry your rucksack on a 10 mile march with them and fire your weapon, you know, the way that you should. What What is on the mind of the voter? To what extent are they uh, not making income, worried about losing their homes, worry about losing their businesses? Let, let's turn to, to that. What are the voters telling you? Well, it's, it's hard to get a read on all of them. I mean, you have to pick it up from social media, individual conversations that you have with them. And uh, I, I tell you what, I think folks feel like the spending is out of hand at the federal government level. I feel like they they uh, are, are not in favor of higher taxes. I think it comes back to core economic issues in this district that they are most concerned about. And uh, now in the wake of the George Floyd um, murder and then the subsequent rioting and looting that happened that had nothing to do with George Floyd's death, by the way, but just were a result of, uh, of activists, uh, you know, or actually rioters and lawless people, um, you know, getting involved in the peaceful protests and then taking it to the next level. So I think that they're worried about safety and security. I think that bothers them as well. Those are the core issues I think that are in this. Now with this corruption scandal, I think it's time to, to remind them of the corruption that goes on. And when there's too much government for sale through legislative procedures, tax credits, tax subsidies, uh, special grants, all of that, when there's too much government for sale, that's when you get corruption. And it's time to remind them that smaller government closest to the people is the best government. And that is what I'm all about. So we've been doing that in a number of ways. We've been dropping literature at our uh, at doors already to persuade folks. We've been making phone calls. We've had Zoom conversations in, in, in with folks. We've built out our infrastructure of volunteers so that you know, come August, we're ready to actually tackle doors. And so we're, we're working it. Again, these campaigns though are largely online. So we've had a really large digital presence. And I'm very thankful for that, that I've got a lot of followers and people in this district that have been following along with it. Yeah, how much does the presidential election factor into your race for Congress? Uh, it, people who know my record know that uh, I don't play follow the leader, just ask Bruce Rauner. Uh, and, and so, and I've stood up to both parties on unbalanced budgets and tax hikes. I've opposed all that, I've opposed corruption. I've called out my own party when I thought the legislation was improper. I have stood alone to protect uh, taxpayers on bad bills regardless of both parties uh, going whole hog into it. So um, I have a record of independence and I am standing on that record. I have a record of standing up for small businesses and that's what we're talking about in this district. Um, I mean, they wanna make it all sound like I'm just some big pro-Trump person. And honestly, I'm a policy person. So when Trump's great on policy, I'm happy to give him kudos for being great on policy. When I think that it's not the way that I would have done things, then I'm happy to make a comment to that effect. But, uh, you know, there's no way Joe Biden's even qualified to be running at this point. It's almost embarrassing and it, it, it's almost cruel, quite frankly, that they're putting forth somebody who obviously cannot string two sentences together. Before we close out. Yeah, no, so there's obvious, yeah. Uh, just one more thing before we stop here. There's also a huge contrast to be talked about with China. I think that is a key issue going forward that we need to take care of. I think China needs to be held accountable. I think Trump will hold China accountable. I think Biden would not. And I think that is to me a scary proposition when you're looking at who's going to lead from the top on foreign policy. 
And uh, China has been a bad actor. They imprison their people. They're cr clamping down on the Hong Kongers. They released this virus to infect the rest of the world when they should have arrested it uh, right in the Wuhan province. And then they lied about what they were doing and they have yet to come clean about everything surrounding the virus and its release. They are bad actors. We ca they can't be trusted. We need to incentivize our manufacturers to come back and produce. Uh, to remove themselves from trying to produce elsewhere, whether it's in the U.S. or some of our the satellite uh, countries that are allies of ours. But we cannot, we have, must hold China accountable. They are a huge national threat. And, um, and, and I think that people, that should be on people's mind when they go to the voting booth. You know, I'll point out as we tape this that just yesterday, the Attorney General William Barr spoke on this issue of China. Uh, if for those who want to watch it, and I would recommend it to him, that's about a 40-minute speech. But he starts off by uh, prefacing his remarks and saying this is going to be one of the most important issues facing us going forward. If what happened in China stayed in China, that would be bad enough. But instead of America's changing China, China is leveraging its economic power to change America. As this administration's China strategy recognizes, the CCP's campaign to compel ideological conformity does not stop at China's borders. Rather, the CCP seeks to extend its influence around the world, including on American soil. All too often, for the sake of short-term profits, American companies have succumbed to that influence even at the expense of freedom and openness in the United States. We, are, we have got to get back to freedom, liberty, respect, the rule of law. The rule of law applied equally to every American citizen. Jeannie, I know we, we got off a little bit on a sidetrack because of the breaking news with the Michael Madigan uh, story and the ComEd, but it's an important story and happy to get your yes. thoughts on it. It's been a little long, like we said before, it's been four months. We wanted to keep uh, tabs on this because uh, your race is going to be one of the key races, not only in Illinois, but uh, around the nation, if the Republicans are to gain back seats and maybe gain enough to retake the House. But even if they don't, it always helps, of course, if you expand the number of seats you have. Uh, we thank That's you for right. joining us. Good luck to you and your campaign. I will also uh, compliment you in this weird world. You do uh, live broadcast on the social media. And con congratulations to you because your, your ability to keep campaigning through the use of social media has been, um, I say as a television person and one who's covered politics for years, really remarkable and better than I've seen, I think, from any other campaign anywhere else in the country. So. Uh, good for you. In that, uh, I have a wonderful staff that helps out with everything. I'm very blessed. Well, thanks again for joining us, and hopefully Thank we you. can connect uh, much much before four months from now. We'll, we'll touch base with you in the fall as well. Sounds great. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for watching, and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.